overview of what we're going to talk through today, you know, first off, we're just going to go over why we're all here, right? Why is content so pervasive in our marketing strategies now? Um, then we're going to go through a few stats, charts, numbers, fun stuff like that, at least for me. Um, talk through how to build a content strategy, and then give some samples of some content that, that rules. Oh, and there's some parting gifts, by the way, so stick around if you can. Great, they're awesome. Yeah. So first, uh, another quick story. So about a year and a half ago, I was looking for a camera to take a picture of overseas with me. So I was looking for something kind of small and light, you know, something that was going to fit in my pocket, and that, you know, something that was kind of cheap, too, in case it fell out, which is nice. Um, so, you know, if I were starting that search, say, you know, five or six years ago, I may have, like, gone to the library and looked at some back issues of consumer reports or something. Uh, or, you know, I'm going to the buyer's guide. But I didn't do that this time, right? A year and a half ago, I just went online and I did Google, of course, right? Um, I asked my social networks, like, you know, on Twitter, I asked people on Twitter, you know, if you're going overseas, what would you buy? Um, you know, I asked people on Facebook, what's, what, what do you think that I should buy to take with me? So somewhere in there, my uh, search caught the attention of Jeffrey Hazel, who was then see him on Kodak. And he's like, hey, Ann, you know, buy this one, right? This is, this is totally right for Ali. So it's cool that this like CMO of this like seven point eight billion dollar company reached out to me, you know, a single consumer. But what's really going on there isn't just cool, right? It's sort of this major shift in how companies are marketing themselves online. You know, Kodak knows that it doesn't have to wait for consumer reports to publish their specs anymore. You know, they can do it themselves. <coughs> So Sears knows this too, right? This is um, a page called SearsYardGuru.com from, you know, off of the Sears website. And basically what this does is it tells you, you know, what lawnmower is right for you. Um, so maybe you're looking for one that's going to be particularly good on, like, hilly terrain or rocky terrain or whatever. Um, so Sears has, like, a solution for you. And interestingly, this isn't just Sears products, right? But there's actually a line in there that talks about Sears competitors. You know, what else is, you know, compared Sears to, say, Lowe's or Home Depot? So this is happening in the B2B space too. This is Richie Wiki, which is published by Richie Brothers up in Vancouver, and they're basically a, a heavy equipment broker. So they sell things like, um, you know, like logging machines and bulldozers and grapple skaters. So anybody know what a grapple skater is, by the way? Yeah. So I, I realized that I wrote this, and I had a, I have a son who, when he was like two years old, he's much older now. But when he was two, he was super into like heavy equipment. So we had all these books about trucks and whatever. So grapple skitter, I found out, you know, 10 years ago, was one of those things that it like picks up logs. It's got like these arms that lift logs like that. So content strategy and heavy equipment information. So lots of lessons that. today. <coughs> so this is a review for some of you who maybe um, you know know some of this stuff. But basically, the reason why Becky and I sort of are, are going back a little bit and talking about you know kind of putting this in a context of why we're here today is because the background in this I think is kind of critical. Um, there are three reasons why you know why companies are so think, are, are into thinking about content these days. It's sort of part of their marketing. It's a, a cornerstone of it. And this is you know a primary reason right here. This is David Nierman Scott. He's the author of a book called The New Rules of Marketing in PR, which probably a lot of you know. Um, and he talks about how you know the rules have changed, right? The web has sort of brought this new element into it. It's not enough to sort of advertise or to do any sort of direct messaging. You should be talking to your customers directly. Sorry. And just like Anne's experience, right, with her camera, all of your customers are out there and they're looking for you, right? So the battlegrounds of marketing aren't happening on radio stations. They're not happening on TV. They're not even happening in print, right? They're happening on the search engine result pages. So they're out there looking for you. And content, unique, valuable content, is ultimately what's going to be found, right? So those companies that are doing that well, they're the ones that get found. You know, and, and I think Brian Sullis put this really well. As brands, we have become media, right? So publishing used to have this huge barrier to entry. If, if we wanted to even think about publishing, we had to think through um, printing costs, distribution, you name it. But now technology, I mean, web content management systems allows anybody to become media, right? As brands, we're now part of the media. Right, which is kind of our first rule of content, right? It's the first one in the book, and I think it's the most fundamental to all of us here. It's really this notion of embracing that you are a publisher, that you now have the capacity for all the reasons that we just talked about to be able to publish this information yourself. 
So sometimes, you know, when I talk to groups like this, you know, it's like I, I sort of get this vibe from, from people that they're saying, you know, well, we're really not publishers, right? That's sort of this thing that, that you associate with, um, you know, distribution costs and printing and paper and so on. You know, you're not a publisher. It's not a skill set that you necessarily need to develop. You're in the business of whatever it is that you're in the business of. You know, you sell software or services or shovels. Um, but the reality is, you know, everybody is a publisher. And that means that it's a long-term commitment, right? If you've got a website, if you're doing business online, you know, you, you, you are a publisher. Um, it's a long-term commitment. It's something that you sort of need to think about, not just as a one-off. It's not a one-and-done thing, but it's, it's a long-term strategy. And as we say, you know, it's kind of like having a baby, right? It's like, it's a lot of fun to think about doing initially, to, to either to create or to, you know, first when you have a baby, how awesome is that? But then, you know, the reality is that, you know, pretty soon, you start to see that, that it's a long term. <laughs> Remember that two-year-old that I talked about with the trucks? Well, this is him now. I'm not, not really, but it seems it's kind of... <laughs> anyway, the idea is that, you know, it's something that you have to think about, you have to bear responsibility for it forever and ever, even when it doesn't seem quite so appealing anymore. But the good news is, right, it's worth it, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about basically companies who are having a lot of success in this and then give you some, some sort of takeaways on how you can kind of replicate that. So when we're talking about content, you know, what, what is it really? What do I mean by content? I mean anything that you are publishing on your website. So that means, you know, your website itself, but all the pages of it too. So not just your home page, but also like things like your product pages or your FAQ page. Um, we're also talking about things that you publish for marketing, like, you know, maybe your blog or webinars or white pages or ebooks, um, any of that stuff that, you, that you're doing. But also think about things that aren't on your site itself, uh, things that you're publishing at, you know, outposts. For example, your LinkedIn group page um, or your or Facebook fan page or group page, um, you know, your Twitter stream, things that, that are sort of out of, off of your main site. Or more simply, you know, the way that Becky and I like to think about it is content is really anything that you create or share to tell your story. And that share piece is something that I think is just as critical as the create piece. So it's about, you know, creating content that really uh, matters to you, that's sort of reflective of who you are. But at the same time, you know, things that you're curating and things that you're sharing with your audience, like, hey, this is cool. You know, something that's going to tell your story, but things that you don't necessarily create yourself. And that piece about, you know, creating things or sharing things that resonate, you know, that's because it's not just about throwing up any kind of content, right? It's not just about putting anything out there. It's about creating engaging content. And that's, again, what we're really going to focus on today. It's not just about, you know, writing for writing's sake, producing anything and then throwing it up there or, or having somebody who really doesn't like to blog and, and having them produce a blog for you. It's about creating really engaging stuff. And this is Joe Polizzi. He's the author of um, another book on content, an awesome book on content, called um, Get Content, Get Customers. And he sort of talks a lot about this notion about how, you know, the one with the most engaging content wins. Because ultimately, you know, maybe I sound a little touchy-feely when I say this, but I really believe it. Good content is really the soul of who you are. And so to me, that this is kind of a, a fundamental takeaway from you know, all of the research that we're going to be talking about, all of the presentation here today. The book that you have, that to me is, is kind of the most interesting, the most fundamental piece. You know, what makes you unique, right? What's your value? You know, how can you then express it through not just you know, your marketing speak, but really through your company's content online? So this to me, you know, good content as a soul of who you are is really critical. Because this is what you want, right? Um, I was at a, a seminar last week in um, South Dakota, of all places, and I heard somebody say that you know the point of good content and sharing it through social media isn't about creating your network necessarily or reaching your network. It's about reaching your network's network. And to me, I was like, yes, that's totally it. That's the value of social media, right? It's about it's about it's about reaching your network's network. And the thing is, is that this really does work. Um, you know, there's, there's tons of stats out here. This is a study that was done by HubSpot recently. And it shows that, I mean, 55% more website visitors for companies that blog. So, right, they're, they're getting more visitors. And we're going to talk through some more specific stats later. But more interestingly, right, there's more inbound links. And we all know, all of us in the SEO world out there, is that inbound links are kind of like the, the gold of SEO, right? We're going to get some nice link juice. We're going to build up some, some authority within our domain. But I think the most important one, 
434% more indexed pages. You know, like I said, the battlegrounds are happening on those search engine result pages. So just companies that blog, right? That's one tactic in many uh, from a content marketing perspective. They're being seen 434% more times than their competitors. Right, and this is some research that, uh, that Marketing Profs did last year. We're actually in the middle of updating it right now, so um, we should have some updated stats on, on this pretty soon. But this is a, um, some research that we did with, with Joe Polizzi's organization, Jim to 42 and we asked about 1,100 um, B2B marketers who are part of Marketing Profs. You know, how, many of you, how many of you are using content in your marketing right now? So I'd like to actually know, just in this room, how many of you are using content of some kind? So that means like blogs or white papers or ebooks or podcasts. That's awesome. Okay, so that's great. So that's actually pretty close. Except I think that was like, that was like uh, 97.3. That was really good. Like that. that was good. So I'm impressed. <laughs> So what are, they, what are they using it for? I need to be able to see this, sorry. Um, so what are they using it for? Their organizational goals are brand awareness, um, loyalty at the top of there. Next, customer retention, then lead generation, then website traffic, and thought leadership, building website traffic, building thought leadership, sales, and then lead nurturing. I don't know if you guys can see this, but I know Ridgeline is gonna make the slides available, so you'll be able to sort of, you know, look at these a little more closely if you are interested in doing that. So what are they using? Um, the red line at the top there is social media, not including blogs, and then article posting. From there goes down to in-person events like this one. Um, E-newsletters, case studies, blogs, white papers, webinars, uh, print magazines, videos, <coughs> all the way down. I know there's a lot to take in here, but um, again, you can, you can dig into this a little bit later. What I love about this slide is that there is so many different options. And right. we're not standing up here saying that you should do them all, but there are a lot of different options to get your message out and get your story out. And it's just about finding what makes the most sense for you and your audience, right? Right. And I think, you know, I mean, coming from the uh, print background myself, and I know Becky's the same way, you know, my default is usually to think about content as text, right? That's kind of what I think about, things that people can read. But again, you know, this slide sort of, sort of dramatizes that, you know, there's a, whole, there's a whole scope of things that I think that, that's available to companies these days. But this to me is kind of the money slide, right? This is the one that sort of tells the story of what's really going on out there. Um, the way we ask content marketers, you know, the, the almost 90% of, of um, B2B marketers were using content. What's your pain though? What's your biggest challenge when it comes to producing content? And you can see there that 36%, that, that big red slice of pie, is uh, producing engaging content. That's their pain, that's their biggest problem. Next is producing enough content at 21 is in the orange there or you know, operational stuff like the budget to produce content or the, or the lack of sea level buy-in. So more specifically, we said, you know, tell us exactly what your, what your problem is. Um, I don't know what to say or how to say it. It's often difficult to find topics that haven't already saturated the market or you know, our biggest challenge is finding things to get excited about, right? We sell something really boring. You know, I don't know how to make that interesting to our customers. So, Think about that slide, right, where it showed like 90% of marketers are using content marketing. That seems really like, wow, if we're not using it, or if we feel like it's not quite working for us, we're really behind, right? But you're not. Because like we say in, in content rules, <laughs> content marketing is like sex in high school, right? Everybody says they're doing it, and you start to feel like everybody else except for me is doing it really well. The reality is, you know, it, that's not the way it is at all, just like, just like sex in high school. So we asked you guys who is using content in their marketing strategies. I'd be curious to know, are any of you guys, do any of you guys have kind of any strategic plan attached to that? Let's get a show of hands. All right, all right. So, so maybe what, you're the math whiz. 33.1. All right, great. The thing is, is that I, I, it, it's very tempting to just jump into it, right? It's like, let's get a blog out, let's get these things. And ultimately, what we would recommend, and I think everyone here would probably agree, is that you've got to have a strategy to start out with. You know, I, the, our customers aren't a, much unlike a lot of what we, we see in this room, right? They're all doing content, but they come and they ask questions like, all right, you know, like we're, we're B2B, so we, we clearly need to be on LinkedIn because that's where businesses are, right? 
or Twitter makes a lot of sense. I mean, everybody's on Twitter. We, we, we've got to be on Twitter. But then I also hear like, Twitter's stupid. Like, why would I ever use Twitter? It doesn't make a bit of sense for my business at all. Literally, these are like quotes that we get on a daily basis, right? And what we would say is this all, is all really pretty stupid if you don't have some kind of strategy. Because it starts to feel like this, right? That's like what our daily lives are in marketing. It's like, what's the latest thing we have to worry about? Pile it on the back, and we're not moving forward. Anne really hates this slide. It's <laughs> so what's the first step in building out a content strategy? Well, you've got to identify your goals. And oftentimes when we say, what's your goals? Uh, people, I, I love this slide too. Um, people will say things like, I want to build up my uh, Twitter followers, or I need to increase my organic traffic. Okay, like those are some really good metrics, but those aren't your goals, right? What are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish on your website? Are you trying to gain loyalty? Are you trying to gain pure money? You're trying to sell things? Figure that out, and this isn't a hard thing, but attach those core goals to your um, content. It's not just simply about getting more followers and more traffic, right? If they're not completing your goals, it's really, they're not very valuable. All right, then we need to figure out who's going to complete these goals, right? So we, audience segmentation, right? And there's a lot of different ways to approach this. Um, there, there's this kind of like basic segmentation that I think a lot of us use. So I have prospective customers and existing customers and prospective employees, this sort of thing, okay? Sometimes we take it a little bit deeper, kind of a task segmentation approach. So we have the researcher versus the decision maker, right? Um, sometimes some of us even take it deeper than that, like look at our sales cycle and we'll segment our audience within that cycle. So are they in the beginning process where they're just being introduced to the concept? Um, are they being introduced to our brand, our specific differentiators, reviewing, you know, you name it. But we kind of like to take it a little bit of a different approach and do intense segmentation, right? How can I help, right? It, it's pretty simple to just think of the different ways that you as a business can help your prospective audiences. From there, we recommend creating a persona matrix. And this feels fancy, but it's really not. And it's something that any of you can do in your conference rooms when you get back to the office. Just sitting down and thinking about, OK, how do we help our different potential customers, existing customers, you name it? And let's put a face to it. Let's put a name to it. Um, we found that, that oftentimes when we're writing content or creating a, a, a site, we stay in the heads of, in our own heads, right? So we're like thinking about what matters to us, what resonates with us, or maybe we're thinking about our grandma or something like that. Like my grandma wouldn't understand that, da 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 da. Or like my kid really likes brown with pink polka dots. We clearly need to have that because we're trying to get a younger demographic. Like no, like what? Get out of your head and get into your customer's head. And the easiest way to do that is to have some kind of personas developed. And literally, I mean, we've had customers will, that will, will create like name tags. And they'll put that name tag on when they're reviewing a strategy or reviewing content so they can think about being, you know, Mark Marketing Manager or whatever his name is. So once we've kind of identified our goals and we've identified high level how we can help people, we've got to take it a little bit deeper, right? How can you really help me? And this is really digging for that underlying pain attached to, to your users uh, or your prospective customers' needs. Um, there's, I'm going to go back to like Psych 101 class here. So forgive me, this isn't meant to be all academic, but. There's a few, like four main ways that we really can drive engagement with users, right? Just us as humans. This is why we engage in things. Um, reciprocity, I'm, I'm going to get something in return if I engage with you. Um, efficacy, by engaging with you, I'm going to have, the, there's going to be a larger impact on me as an individual, my family, my business, the world, you name it. Um, recognition, I'm going to be recognized in some fashion for, for engaging with you. And then communion, I'm going to be able to be a part of a community. So these are just like human factors that drive engagement. But if we can start attaching this to our content, that's how we start creating engaging content. So just to kind of put a picture to this, we, again, it's, it's about making this into some kind of matrix, right? So figure out the different underlying pains that you have, right? So um, let's see here. 
communion. So, so here's an example. So I just had a baby like eight, eight months ago. And um, I really want to run a marathon um, probably this fall. And I just, my knees are not really great. I ran one a few years ago, all kinds of things. And there's a lot of different companies that could potentially serve my needs, right? I really need a company that's going to help me to understand how to run with, with knees that aren't great, that's going to push me and help me to train in a good way. Nike's doing stuff like this, that Adidas sort of thing. But this little company up in Boulder, Newton Running Company, is the one that ultimately got my business. And I just, I was out on the web and I was searching and they provided this entire experience about um, it, how to, what, what kinds of shoes you really need if you're trying to run a marathon, what's going to make a difference, um, and ultimately how to keep training in a way that, that will get you to your end goal. They got my business, and Nike didn't, because they, they spoke to my underlying pain. Nike was like, we have shoes. And Newton Running was like, we have shoes that are going to solve this knee problem that you have, if that makes sense. So here's an example. We're all very familiar with pods, hopefully. Um, big white containers that you see in people's driveways, right? It seems pretty straightforward, right? Moving and storage. But once you sit down, it's really not, right? We, 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 took a, we did this exercise with pods where we tried to figure out all of the different like, underlying pains attached to their services. So it's not just we'll help people move or we'll help them with their storage needs. We're going to help them declutter their home. We're going to help them um, with their home staging needs. We're going to help them when they get a divorce and they don't know what to do with their stuff, right? So we dug a little bit deeper and we found some, some potential concepts for content that spoke to that bigger pain. It's not just about needing to move or needing temporary storage. It's that I just got a divorce and I don't know what to do. And then we threw some data to it, right? So again, for the SEOs out there in the world, this is a pretty familiar exercise. We'll go out and do some keyword research, figure out what people are searching in the search landscape as it relates to certain terms and phrases. But you can use this in your content strategy too, right? You can start to see trends, um, things like decluttering tips or home staging tips or, or even you know, business record storage, office record storage, and that starts to drive your content decisions. All right, so as Anne likes to say, now it's time for the fun stuff. But I thought my part was fun too. No, your but. Stuff is awesome, so. <laughs> Right, but the, you know, the strategic stuff is the hard stuff, right? It's that's hard. That's stuff that people struggle with a little bit. And, um, but no, but that's, so you've got the strategy piece. You've got that in place. You're thinking about, all right, you know, what is our, what's the higher pain that, that we need to connect with our customers over? So what next, right? What are you going to develop or, or how are you going to make your own content rule? So I'm going to go through just eight, eight ways and, and show you some companies who are, are doing it really well. One of the fundamental content rules is this one, right? Share or solve, don't shill. Um, what does that mean? You know, it means that you want to share a resource with your, with your customers, potential customers. You, know, you want to solve problems for them, like Becky was talking about with the running shoes. Uh, you don't want to shill. So Cece and I spoke to a, to a group in, um, in Australia not too long ago, and, and we used the word shill here, and nobody knew what it meant. So I always feel a need to explain it, but you know, it just means don't sell, right? You're not just, you're not just selling, you're not just shilling. So who does this really well? Um, this is work shifting. This is a site that's published by Citrix online. Um, you know, Citrix sells uh, software, right? I mean, they, they sell a platform, a platform to help people who work in their houses connect with other people. So people who work in their jammies read this site. Um, you know, very much about having a broader mission, you know, sort of thinking about your content as an opportunity to connect with your customers, to, to meet their needs, like Becky was talking about. They do a really great job here. This is not a site that talks about technology. This is a site that's geared toward people who work at home. So there's all kinds of stuff on here, you know, anything from taxes to, you know, um, uh, you know, working out of coffee shops, you know, third places, all this kind of stuff. It's very much geared toward helping those people, you know, kind of where they're at in their jobs. Another company that does this really well, who, uh, who shares resources and solve problems for people, is um, Robertson Jerky. This is a law firm. They're based in Florida, and they are going after this business, right? They basically want to sue the pants off of any company that's been producing defective drywall. So they have this, this company called ChineseDrywallProblem.com. Um, you guys know the, the issue with Chinese drywall? You know what I'm talking about? So just real quick, it's basically um, a couple of years ago, actually early 2000s, the U.S. started importing 
you know, un unwittingly this, um, this defective drywall. And when it was in houses, um, it started to emit these sort of toxic fumes and people who lived in the houses got sick. So Robertson Jerky went after this business, right? So they didn't just put up, you know, a, a corporate website. They instead put up this, which is a clearinghouse for Chinese drywall problems. So there's content on there that they're producing. So they, they blog about it, they produce um, e-books about it to sort of help people who have these problems. But at the same time, they're also curating information, you know, that share piece that we talked about. So they're pulling in information from, you know, uh, Associated <coughs> Press or Wall Street Journal or, or wherever. And they're putting their content before their contact, right? So and their, their first goal here is to help people, to become a resource. Secondly, they're letting you know, oh, and by the way, this is Robertson Jerky, and here's, here's how to get in touch if you want to, or if you need to, if you have this problem. Now compare that with this, right? This is their homepage of their corporate site. You know, perfectly fine website, but this doesn't scream, I'm here to help you, right? This screams, this is a corporate law, law site. I mean, okay. <laughs> Second rule of content marketing, show, just don't tell. Um, <laughs> What does that mean? It means basically, you know, show how your products and services live in the world, right? Don't just tell people, you know, that, that you are who you are. Really show them. Give them a real sense of, of the tangibleness of your product or service. This is an example of a company that does that. This is Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board. You know, their whole, their whole sort of premise is that they're a, um, a nonprofit set up to help Wisconsin dairy farmers kind of market their cheese. So this is a perfectly fine website. I mean, it's actually kind of nice, right? But it's sort of talking about, you know, Wisconsin cheese, it's our pride and passion, and we love cheese and all this stuff. But compare that with this, right? This is also published by the Wisconsin cheese, cheese, um, Milk, milk sorry, something milk board. board. <laughs> it's called the Grilled Cheese Academy. And I love this because it really shows in, in a very sort of tangible, like awesome way, you know, it's like, do you market cheese or do you make awesome grilled cheese sandwiches, right? So it's that little shift, I think, that makes all the difference. Um, and by the way, this, this is just a site and I encourage you to just go there and look at it later, but there's so much about this that sort of incorporates so much about what makes for rich, good content. Um, you know, it has sharing icons, it's, you know, got awesome photography, there's some audio components to it, there's some, you know, sharing how-to recipe kind of stuff going on there. It's just, it's just really awesome stuff. GE is doing this really well. Um, they have a product called Nucleus, which essentially um, helps people to monitor their home energy usage. So they have the typical like product page with all of the specs and descriptions and benefits and you name it. But they also have this page that um, really speaks to the end user, right? So they're running a pilot program in Martha's Vineyard. And rather than just saying, look at how great we are, and da 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 da, they have people who are using the product um, sharing videos about what, it, what kind of difference it's made to them, both from a saving money perspective and just how they feel that the impact that they're having on the environment. So again, their users are telling the story, not them. And it's much more powerful because of that. Right, sometimes, you know, I, I work with a lot of B2B companies and I hear from them, you know, well, we don't have anything that's like, as interesting as, you know, as home energy, or we don't have anything that's kind of as sexy as, you know, an, a grilled cheese sandwich. We can't take a picture of that, right? Because we're a B2B company. We sell something kind of intangible. Um, so this is an example of a company that's figured out a way to sort of let their customers tell their story. This is um, Curata, uh, also known as High Fire. They're uh, a company up in Boston, where I'm from. And um, they do a nice job about letting their customers tell their story. So this is the executive director of the Western Massachusetts Economic Development Corporation. And she's talking about what High Fire does for them. Now what Hot Fire is, is essentially um, a service that will curate news and other headlines for you so that you can kind of become a resource to your own, um, to your own people, right, to your own customers. And so what, the, what they do for the Western Mass EDC, this woman says in this video here, is that, you know, that she, um, it allows the Western Mass, Western Mass EDC to, to be a resource to small businesses to sort of help them in their lives. So again, it's letting your customers tell their story. It's about sort of saying, okay, you know, what, what can we do for you? Um, the other reason why I really like this as, as a, an example is because 
all they did, all, all Curata High Fire did, was take this sort of simple flip video camera, sit down with this woman in her office, and you know, had her talk, you know, basically from her heart about you know, sort of what her role was with small businesses in Western Mass. And what I really like about that is it's very simple, right? Not huge production values, not really expensive to produce, but just very simple, but very powerful at the same time, because it's in her words. <coughs> so speaking of words, you know, I've been an editor in this space, uh, in the marketing space specifically, for a long time now. And one of the, the content rules that marketing process that also translates into, I think, just in general for marketers is this one, just to speak human. Right? What does that mean? This is one that our publisher didn't want to put in the book because she said, you know, doesn't everyone speak human? You know, isn't your whole audience human? And it's like, yeah. But you know what? Like I said, I've been in this space a long time and I hear words all the time that are not really human words, you know? Words like impactful or learnings or synergistic or paradigm shift or proactive or drill down or incentivizing or any word that ends in like an ising. Um, so we call them Frankenspeak in the book and I just encourage you to please don't use them because those aren't words that your, that your customers want to hear necessarily. They're not human words. They don't mean much. I think there's a far more effective way to communicate that. And this is Citrix again. And one of the reasons why I like this site again is not just because of that whole share or solve thing, but also because they speak human really, really well. And this is a problem that um, you know, a lot of us, it's a trap that a lot of us can fall into, right? It's like, and, and I do it too. I mean, I, I sometimes will let incentivizing slip out. And leverage. Yeah. Leverage, right, that's another <laughs> one. Um, but it helps, I think, to think about getting perspectives outside of your company to create content for you. And this is what Citrix is doing here. So they have people like you know, Chris Brogan, I'm sure a lot of you guys know, um, or, or Greg Rollett. And, and they're sort of talking about you know, sort of working at home or working in their jammies or working out of their coffee shop or whatever. Um, and they're not using words like incentivizing and drilling down because that's not their language, right? So even if you in, in, are, are tempted to use those words in the way you communicate, Think about you know, pulling in some of your customers or, or thinking about people who use your product. Have them create some content for you. And by the way, you know, this is a nice mix. They also have people who are within Citrix who are also creating content for them. So our next content rule is to build momentum. You know, unless you are like a, um, a, a, a writer or a journalist, you know, you're not just creating content for content's sake, right? The, the content that we are creating as, as business owners and marketers is really about driving behavior, right? You want to build a path to conversion. You want to create some momentum with what you're doing. And I think that a mistake that's pretty common is that uh, we'll, we'll feature some content on our site and then people are left thinking, okay, what now? Like, that was a good read, but now what? Well, Hover Around really does a good job of getting around that. So they, uh, they are their power chairs um, for folks with Medicare. And um, on every piece, they, they have a lot of content about Medicare, <coughs> about wheelchairs, about caregiving, you name it. But every piece of content really prompts people to get started down the path of getting more information around Hover Around. And they just walk them through it very simply in a human way. Um, it, it doesn't leave you thinking like, okay, I, I don't know what to no, do right, now, right. but right. thanks for the information. Right. So someone else who does this really well is, um, is my friend Danny Brown. He's a, um, he's a social media consultant, and he does a good job of sort of letting you know when, when you land on his blog what to do next. You know, he does a good job of creating momentum with his customers or kind of you know, creating that path to conversion. Um, and he does it very simply at the end of every one of his blog posts. And I don't know if you guys can see it because it's kind of dark. Um, but he, you know, he throws the, the icons. First of all, this thing is huge on the page, so it's very, you can't miss it, right? Um, and the sharing icons up at the top there, loved it, share it. More from Danny, he tells you immediately how to subscribe via RSS or email. But one of the things that he does that I really like and I don't see very much of is that he then says, like, related posts that include photos. So simple things that you can think about, you know, what's really going to create some excitement? What's going what's to bring people along that path? And this seems like such a no-brainer, but like, I mean, honestly, you would be surprised right. at how few businesses we find it doing really, this. It's really hard to find this example. Yeah. How hard it is to um, <laughs> and, and the thing is, I think why it's hard is because of the technology, right? So it's, it's tough to like create an article and then you have to create all of the supporting content around it. Right. So try to find tools that allow you to have like tags or we call them index terms, you name it, that help you to surface related content. So suddenly you're reading a blog post like about Facebook and you can see white paper on using Facebook in your marketing efforts and you can download an ebook and you can sign up for a webinar, you name it, right? Let the technology do that work for you 
but don't forget about it. Don't just not, you know, make sure you're addressing that in some fashion. Okay, so the next content rule is to do something unexpected. Um, what do we mean by this? We mean, you know, think about sort of something that's a little bit off-center, something that's going to surprise your audience a little bit. Um, by surprise, we don't mean inappropriate. We mean for it to be very much in line with your brand and who you are. But at the same time, you know, just to have a little fun, you know, just to sort of lighten up a little bit in the way that, that you're marketing your company. Um, this is an example of a company that does this really well. This is Agilent. It's, a, it's a, a pretty, you know, conservative uh, product, I guess you would call it, but they do this thing that's just hilarious. It's, um, it's called puppetchemistry.com, and they're targeting medical researchers with this, okay? So just bear that in mind. Well, we're going to play this. Hopefully it will play. Hopefully. Can you guys hear that? So if you can't hear that, they're actually speaking in four, kind of foreign languages. One, one's in speaking in Japanese, one's speaking in German. It's hilarious. Like, maybe you just have to spend some time with it, but it's seriously hilarious. We could sit and watch this for hours, but in the interest of time. This is different, you guys. This is fun, and, and you'll learn. It's also working for them. That seriously cracks me up. <laughs> Okay, so real quickly, just uh, flying through the last few content rules here. Stoke the campfire. You know, what, is this, what does this mean? It means that to think about your content as something that you are wanting your customers to kind of gather around, right? Just like a, a real campfire in the real world. Um, think about, you know, sort of how you are not only getting your, your customers to connect with you, but how you're sort of encouraging them to connect with each other as well. So this is a site that does it really well. This is um, P&G, Procter & Gamble's site, Man of the House. Um, they do a nice job of kind of creating this campfire, right, of, of, um, of sort of providing this forum for people to talk to each other. And you can kind of see that they're also doing some unexpected stuff. They're, they're creating some really fun content here. Four reasons men should not tuck in a shirt. Who isn't compelled to click on that? I didn't know there were four reasons. I knew two, but um, also. <laughs> things you should never say to a coworker. Um, this aside is very similar to sort of the citrus example that I, that I gave earlier or American Express Open Forum, which, you know, is, is also another example of this. But they do a nice job of not talking about P&G products, right? The whole thing is branded with P&G, but it's very much about the end user. It's about getting that campfire roaring. So creating wings and roots, you know, um, again, you, you often hear this as applied to parenting, right? You want to give your children wings to help them soar and kind of roots to keep them grounded. I think it applies really well to content too. You know, give your content wings to sort of soar across the social web, but at the same time, keep it very much grounded in who you are as a company. The Denver Botanic Gardens does this well. So, so they have a great site with, with a fair amount of content, a blog that's um, heavily engaged with both internally and externally. And they've built out a really um, interesting Facebook and Twitter strategy that's not just about like, hey, here's our most recent post. It's about engaging people and getting a conversation going. But it's important to note that their site is where the core of their content is, right? So as Anne likes to say, they're not using rented land like Facebook to promote their core content. They have that out there on their site. And they're using Facebook and Twitter as a way to have a conversation and get people back to the site. Examiner's doing this really well. Um, so Examiner's a site that uh, pretty much a lot of different freelancers write articles for them. But what's interesting is that they've embedded a lot of different ways to give their content those wings, right? To get content out there and shared in the social space. Um, if you put a comment on anything within Examiner, it's posted there, but it's also posted out to your Facebook wall. So suddenly, you're, you're grabbing onto your network's network, right? And you're able to get, um, give your content that, those wings to really see it uh, out there successful and succeed. Okay, so reimagine, don't recycle. Do you, do you get that the robot has <laughs> now reimagined himself into like a Rubik's Cube? You know, he was like a, a, a regular robot with like, you know, arms and legs, and now he's a Rubik's Cube. Get it? It's kind of... I think um, it, it's clever. You know that thing like how you should, like, it's not funny if you have to explain it? Anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is hilarious and no one ever gets it. I think it's time to retire the slide, but anyway. <laughs> What does that mean? It means like, you know, not, what's that? Just 
reimagine it. I know, just reimagine <laughs> it, right. So, um, so don't think about your content as kind of a one-off, but think about it as kind of a piece of a larger whole, right? So what can you create that you can then sort of reimagine? Not repurpose or reuse, but really, you know, sort of recast in, in different ways. Um, who's doing this really well? This is Open View Labs, um, also where I am in Boston. This is a VC company. And they do a nice job of kind of creating five things out of one thing. You know, they may create like a white paper, an ebook, and then they'll interview the author of the ebook and release that as an audio. Um, they'll then get them on camera and release a, a, a video. Then they'll chunk up that video into sort of five different, you know, soundbite kind of things. So they do a nice job of sort of thinking, all right, we have this big content asset. How do we reimagine it? This is Canaxis, they're a supply chain management company. These guys have like a black belt in, in content marketing, really, and they create 10 things out of one thing. Um, they do a really amazing job of kind of coming up with something that's based usually on search keywords on, on a monthly basis, a bigger content asset, and then they kind of reimagine it, right, in 10 different ways. So we've been throwing a lot of things out here like, you know, Canaxis and um, work shifting and Examiner and all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, that stuff is cool, right? But does it really work? Is it really driving business? Or is it just, you know, is it just content for content's sake? And th these are just a few stats from some of the examples we showed. Um, Denver Botanic Gardens, so when they ha launched their new site with a blog, they have since seen triple digit growth in organic traffic. So huge amount of traffic, but more importantly, a 40% increase in membership. And that was during a time when their marketing budget was cut significantly. So there was not any addition, other, mar I mean, literally, they're not doing any radio anymore. They can't do any billboards. It's they're relying on online to, to gain members, and it grew by 40%. Um, Hover Round see, are seeing great results. They just launched their new site a couple months ago. And just one month after launch, 15% growth in organic traffic and a 28% um, growth in site-wide conversion. So again, they, people aren't just left coming to content and then like, what should I do now? Hover Rounds are driving them to this lead form and they're seeing a huge uptick as a result. Uh, Pods, so they've seen a really good increase in organic traffic, but more importantly, 32% more web orders. So prior to um, it, about 17, 18 months ago, um, their web to, to offline mix was there was like 17% of their orders came from web and the rest came through like a call center. That's now nearing 30%. And they, they purely, they, they look to their content and their SEO strategy um, as, as the main factor in that. Right, so um, we're going to go through this pretty quickly just in the interest of time because we're kind of butting up against oh, we do some, that too um, much. some constraints here. <laughs> but anyway, um, Open View Labs, they had more than 30,000 visits in six months and 3,000 new e-newsletter e e subscribers, which is kind of their main, main goal is to drive, uh, to, to get more involved with people through their e-newsletter. Um, Canaxis, this stuff is, is um, available to you guys afterwards too, just so you can sort of dig into this a little bit more. Ton of stats here, ton of stats here. They had a 2.7 um, times increase in web traffic. They had a 3.2 <coughs> increase in conversions. Um, you know, double-digit increase in paid subs to their rapid response, which is their their software as a service product, and so on. And this is work shifting. Now, what's really amazing about this is is uh, you know this is a Citrix example that I, I talked about earlier. What's amazing about this, and I don't know if you can see it, but right under work shifting, you know, it, it says like about. 2 million results, right? So they sort of invented their own category here. They sort of created this whole content category. And it's now become sort of part of the business vernacular. It's become, you know, part of the, part of the language of business. Work sh I mean, Citrix owns this, which is really pretty amazing. OK, so real quick again, Puppet Chemistry, more than 8,000 unique views, which is four times greater than any other campaign that they did. And then Chinese drywall problem. Um, this is Roberts and Durkee that I talked about earlier. Um, they rank consistently in the top 10 for organic search results. They have, they have every month, they have about between three and 4,000 unique visitors. They've gotten 150 new cases. 50% of their leads come through that blog or, or site that they put up. Um, and sort of a nice side bonus to this, they've also gotten a ton of earned media. You know? So what do I mean by that? It means that they've been quoted in like Time and the Wall Street Journal. Um, in the Associated Press, you know, that's sort of a nice, a nice side to any content strategy. Now, I know we're coming up at the end, so I'm going to go through these very, very quickly. Um, again, this is all going to be available to you, but, you know, ultimately, if we don't have a plan to support all of this great content strategy and that sort of thing, it's never going to work. So here are our suggestions um, for creating 
a plan. First off, you have to be realistic, right? I think a lot of times when we start thinking through content marketing, we're like, okay, we're going to blog every day and then we're going to tweet twice an hour and blah, blah, blah. No. Like, if you, if, if you can create, you know, one white paper a quarter and that's all you can do, then do that and do it well. Um, try to work in accountability into your plan, right? Identify who's going to do what. Identify specific due dates. Um, play into passion. You know, I think that oftentimes uh, we, we try to just get people out there blogging or whoever it might be, but at the end of the day, you know, I just said at the end of the day, but um, if people think blogging sucks, they're going to write sucky blogs. So figure out what people can do in your organization and what they want to do and play into that. Um, try to identify the approval process up front. We know that there's, this is oftentimes a big burden, legal review, you name it. Just figure that out up front and work it into your plan. And use technology in a smart way, right? Make sure that you have a system that's driving your business goals instead of like hampering them. So building out a, a, a editorial calendar. These are like some quick, I think it's 11 slides. I'm gonna go through it super quick. Um, the way we think of this is kind of a spreadsheet and these are the columns and then we literally just build out rows of content ideas. Start with your goal. We already went through this. If you don't have a goal attached to your content, it's probably not going to work. Um, then identify your audience who you're trying to speak to. Figure out what's the message, right? What's the story that we're trying to tell and, and what's the best format? And sometimes that's going to be determined by your capabilities and sometimes it can be determined by your audience and what they're looking for. Figure out, is this content timely or evergreen? I think um, we're, we're tempted to jump in and want to do evergreen content because it lasts forever. So that's a journalism term, but it mainly means that content that, that doesn't ever die, right? It's going to live forever. But timely content has an, is important too, so just think through a good mix there. Like, can we have some content around events, news events, you name it. Identify who's going to create this content and who's going to implement this content. And hopefully if you have a really easy content management system, those can be one and the same. But that's not always the case, right? So you write your content and then you need somebody else to put it up on, you need to contact IT to get it up on the site. Just figure that out and have that identified in the process. Um, when will the content be published? Pretty straightforward. You know, have a, a schedule in place. Who needs to approve the content? So we went through this, you know, identify that approval process. And if you can avoid making it something that you're sending emails or slapping paper on the desk, do that. Many content management systems have built-in workflow. So, so research that and look and see if that's something that you can start to use to just automate that. Where will the content be published? So is this going to be on your site, on your YouTube channel, out on Twitter? Um, it, it, your blog, identify that up front, and then also figure out who's, how you're going to promote it, right? So oftentimes we think, oh, we have all our, our share tools on our piece of content, on our article, it should work, we're good to go. You can't rely on your network to promote your content. That's a good added bonus. You've got to be out there marketing it as well. So is this a matter of just putting it out on Twitter and Facebook, or are you going to do something with your newsletter? Put it in your plan from the very get-go. And then I think this is probably the most overlooked of anything, but right from the very beginning, what's your success metrics attached to this content? And this is where things like increased organic traffic attached to this specific term might come in, or increased, increased Twitter followers, things like that, right? So these are those metrics versus the goals. And make sure that you have a system and a person identified to measure that, right? So it doesn't matter if you say, this is how I'm going to measure success, if nobody in the end is ultimately seeing if it is successful and helping to make decisions based off of that. And then lastly, does this content need to be archived? Do we need to think about what's going to happen to this content over the course of its life, right? Because oftentimes, let's say you're writing about an event, well, what happens after the event? Should that page change? Should that article change? You know, I guess I would say it's not really that overwhelming, and this is kind of like the journalist in me. Just go back to like the five W's. You know, why are you doing this? What's the story? Who's the audience? Who's the approver? Who's the writer? When is it going to be published? When does it need to be archived? And where is it going to be published and promoted, right? So it's just those five W's in a pretty simple spreadsheet. I don't want to simplify it. I don't want to make it not sound like it's not good, work, hard work. But it's something that, again, every single one of you guys can do. 
So we have two final things. Right, so real quick, uh, two final things. Um, we threw a lot of stuff at you today. You don't have to do everything. You don't have to be all things to all people. You don't have to create, you know, ebooks and webinars and blogs and podcasts and, and all of it. But you've got to play to your strengths, right? So we like to say, you've got to do at least one thing really, really well. And start there. We get that question a lot. You know, well, where, where do we begin? What do you want to do? Tap into your passion. What can you sustain for all the reasons that, that Becky just talked about in the editorial calendar? This is Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, he's a great example of somebody who does one thing really, really well, and is sort of from that, you know, sort of leveraged it to become this, you know, to dominate the world, really. Um, but he started out as, as a video blogger, and he's great on video. He does it amazingly well, and from that, you know, his his content strategy has evolved. And finally, this is kind of the unofficial 12th rule: it's to have fun. This is uh, me and my my co-author Cece Chapman on a photo shoot. Um, you know, if you're not having fun when you're doing the content, you're not doing it right. There's something wrong there. So just, you know, have fun. Again, you know, do something unexpected. Relax. Have fun with it. It's an awesome way to sort of communicate with your customers, you know, to, to talk to them directly. With an idea toward also, you know, building momentum, right? So this is a quote from Arianna Huffington, who spoke at a Marketing Cross event in Arizona about a year and a half ago, and she talks about this notion about how content is something that's, that's really a driving force, right? She says if you're consuming old media, you're consuming it on your couch. If you're consuming new media, you're consuming it on your horse, right? And what does she mean by that? It means it's all about, you know, moving forward. So think about that from the reader's point of view. It's, it's about driving momentum, it's about moving forward, it's about sort of leading your customers to where you want them to be.